head of production at The Ringer, where she also writes about TV and the NBA and appears on several podcasts. She hosts Bachelor Party, which focuses on The Bachelor, The Bachelorette, the fran and the franchise's other spin-offs and the reality TV landscape. She also co-hosts co Jam Session, a podcast about celebrity culture on Channel 33, and the erstwhile Sources Say, a basketball podcast on the Ringer NBA show. Yeah. As head of production, she oversees the podcast, video, and social teams. This includes the day-to-day -day operations, working on developing and launching new podcasts, and the best ways to distribute all of The Ringer's content on social media and video and audio platforms. She was born and raised in New York City and graduated from Northwestern University. Let's please welcome Juliet. Thanks. Hi. Um, when I first read your bio and saw the monumental uh, scope of your job, <laughs> I was like, how are we going to cover all that in an hour? And we aren't. Um, we're going to do our best to cover okay. important pieces of it. But I really am interested in um, how you got there. Sure. And I want to start with, um, uh, you grew up in the city, yes. in New York City. And I want to talk, what was your childhood like uh, there? And um, What's it like growing up in the city? I mean, we live in the country. <laughs> uh, I loved it. I uh, I went to high, I grew up in Manhattan, but I went to high school in the Bronx. So I spent, you know, a minimum two hours a day on the subway, and I like really loved the commuting. Not because I particularly liked like being on a packed subway car, but just sort of that um, in between time that was sort of both communal with other people on the subway and other people going to school. Yeah. Um, but also just like time to read or occasionally hang out with friends or who knows. It just it felt like a really um, freeing part of being in high school, and that just sort of um, I, I loved it. And as a result, would just kind of like on the weekends take the subway somewhere to yeah. just sort of like explore a different part of the city or meet up with friends or whatnot. And I just loved it. I loved just sort of like running around and uh, going to different neighborhoods and whatnot. So I I love New York. I I go back as much as I can. Yeah. I was just there for a while over the summer, which was really nice. And yeah, I loved it. I think I also, um, I live in a, like a pretty small apartment in LA and it never occurred to me that you wouldn't live in like a small apartment or that you, <laughs> you wouldn't always be cramped. Right. Um, I'm so, so used to it. I think like also when I, when I went to college and I lived in a dorm, which I think obviously you all have a lot of experience with. I was also like, this feels totally yeah. normal to me. Like I, I, I always like just kind of got used to and also like being in small spaces yeah. with a lot of people around. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> when I came up here last night, I was like very confused i'm definitely I, dark I, yeah i was like it's dark <laughs> and it, it just is it's just so different but i've been in california for over 10 years so i've experienced a lot of california life now and i like it out here a lot as well um what were you passionate about as a kid teenager well you knew me as a child i did well so i full disclosure i told them yesterday that i've known you <laughs> since you were a long time um, I've always loved sports and TV. Um, like my dad, I used to go to summer camp and my dad would mail me, he would clip out the draft order of the NBA draft and send it to me in the mail so I could like read it. And I just like always loved basketball. I'm named for Julius Irving. Um, who's one of my what? dad, my dad's favorite players. Yeah. Not, no, what? <laughs> yeah. How did I not know that about you? <laughs> yeah. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not. <laughs> How um, did I not know that? So, awesome. Yeah, I just and then I always loved, loved, loved television, and uh, I like got my first TV when I was eight. Uh -huh. I remember like having a friend come over to like watch TV with me. Yeah, and it just became something like like a passion beyond a way to spend time, but something I was just really interested in. And, uh, you know, I was in high school when the internet really started, it was taking off and there was like spoiler communities or, or like fan communities around different television shows. And I would like get home from school and like go on message boards and like read about like, what are the rumors? Like what's coming up on Felicity and on Dawson's Creek. And I just always loved television. And now, and that, uh, lucky for me has those two things have become a huge part of my work, which yeah, is yeah. awesome. Um, and yeah, I just, uh, it's pretty cool that something that was like a casual, 
uh, or I didn't feel casual at the time, but probably to outsiders, a casual hobby or passion. There's nothing has... casual about Dawson's Creek. Like, there's no <laughs> casualness I bet. about that. Like that's real. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's. It just was cool that I the, the stuff I cared about when I was a teenager is still a huge part of what I do now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that is is obviously awesome and really yeah. fun. Um, we met at camp. Camp yes. was a heat. We spent two hours literally just talking about camp last night. I was so homesick when I got home last night. Camp sick. I, I, yeah, I was super camp sick. I'm <laughs> camp sick this morning. Um, but camp was such a huge part of both of our lives. Um, and can you talk briefly about what the impact camp had on your life? And then sure. were there any lessons or that experience help you in the world you're in today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say I am not necessarily predisposed to um, group work, but I actually really learned to love collaboration and teamwork at camp and has something that has suited me really well. Yeah. I don't think it's something that's natural to me, but um, just, which you know, it's not natural to everyone, but just sort of going to camp and every summer being encouraged to work with the your peers and the counselors to whether it's just like on a ropes course or whether it was like just because you didn't want to do an activity but you had to sort of making something you did together is something that has suited me really well and something I, I haven't forgotten about. I yeah. also would say my closest closest friends yeah. are my camp friends who I met yeah. when I was nine years old and I yeah. spent every summer with them um, and we're still really close uh, 25 years later. Right. So we still talk all the time. Um, and I, I think that just the sense of community and, and shared experience when you're going through it, you might not necessarily recognize that you're that something like really profound is happening. Yeah. But when you kind of move on from it, the experience stays with you and it's something that only a certain group of people can understand. And so it's just a connection that you have for so long yeah. um, that, is, that is really meaningful because it's such a specific experience tied to a time and a place and the people who were there are the only ones who get it. It's it's so for my my I'll share you my indelible memory of of Juliet was is that you were the center of the center of the center of literally all information <laughs> through the entire four hundred person camp and if anything was going on it was and you were able to track the lives of twenty different bunks the counselors and the kids going on in it in a way that I thought oh my god she's a, a savant <laughs> thank you well I remember I would prefer to like hang out in the office where like the happenings were going on where people were like reporting issues or conflicts or even just like here's what bunk 12 is doing today yeah. etc i like really preferred being in like the nervous system of camp to playing soccer right. i just preferred to be like where the information was <laughs> and uh yeah I, but you know i think that also sort of speaks to that community allowed you to find your place in it and if you if you could make it work within the structure of day to day, that was totally accepted. And that was really meaningful because it, you know, encouraged me to um, really embrace the things that I cared about and find a way to make my own identity a part of the broader community. It's so funny. The way you just described camp is the way a lot of people describe this same community <laughs> here and finding their place in it. And it's just, we do school. It's a lot less fun. I mean, there's a lot of fun. <laughs> Sorry. There's a lot of fun, but there's academics involved too. <laughs> Um, I, think, you know, I didn't mean to just let it close fun. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> didn't mean to say that. Can we edit that out? We will find a way to edit okay. that out. Okay, no problem. We'll take that part out. Um, we have a fourth of this room getting ready to get off the launch pad and go to college. Um, cool. Share about the best part of your college experience and um, what, what part of your college experience mostly benefited you in your career path. Sure. Because um, I think it's, it's a tough thing for, for, you know, our seniors right now going, like, what do I, where do I want to go? What am I going to study? Like, you know, so translate how your college experience has helped you sure. in your career. So uh, two things. First of all, I went to Northwestern in Chicago because, like, I just had heard about counselors at camp who went there. I was like, I, I grew up in New York, and I think a lot of people in the Northeast just stay there because it's familiar, it's close to family and whatever, but I, I was pretty sure I wanted to go to mid, the Midwest um, and try a different part of the country and just explore something different. And I was like, what about Northwestern? And I, I didn't even know that much about it. I don't, I just had like heard about it at camp and then I went to visit it and I, I really liked it. Um, I entered 
pre-med, thought I would be a doctor. Um, and I went to a science focused high school. So I had taken a ton of chemistry and statistics and math throughout high school, which I loved. And I, I really thought that I wanted a career in science and I got there and I just, I hated chemistry. I was just like, this is just not the type of chemistry I thought I liked. Um, Where's Kelly? Um, yeah. there. And was <laughs> why she entered pre med. Yeah, I, I thought it'd be pre med. And, and, <laughs> and then I um, I had a few really great professors who I found really empowering who were eager to discuss with me and my classmates like ideas about books. And I, I also always really loved to read. So I really found um, that I was being drawn towards more English and history classes. And then uh, the best thing that happened to me in college is that I applied to be in this program that I didn't get into at the end of my freshman year. It was like a, a small humanities-based program. Um, and I didn't get in. And then the next year, another professor encouraged me to apply again at the end of my sophomore year. And I did get in. And that was great. And um, I think and I think college can be filled with so many different ideas and people doing so many different things. And you go and you go from you know a small high school community to a, a bigger university or college where everyone's pursuing a different path. And they're sort of um, entwined, you're entwined with the people around you, but you also can and should do your own thing. But it can be hard to find your own thing. And so I was really lucky to have. Uh, teachers and professors who encouraged me to pursue this uh, program, which was called American Studies. And then I kind of ended up in this space where I had two really great mentors. And at the end of college, um, one of them said, I don't think you should move to New York. So I, I got you an internship in San Francisco. I think what? you should do it. And how, how did that happen? Um, I just really liked this magazine. It was called The Believer. It still exists. It's a literary magazine. And he had contributed to it. And he knew I was a really big fan. And so he thought that I still needed to expand my world more. So he suggested I move to San Francisco. Wow. And I did. And I planned to go for just the internship for three months. And then I stayed for three years. What was the internship? Um, I started out as a fact checker. So once the articles had kind of gone through the process of um, How being edited. at that time? I was 22. 22, you graduated. Yeah. And so I would, and I would just, you know, you go through each article with a really fine, finely sharpened pencil and you like underline each thing that could be construed as a fact. And then you have to check it, whether you call someone to confirm with the source or you use research on the internet and whatnot. And then from, from there, I uh, started as an intern and then I, it was at a company called McSweeney's, which uh, also has an online literary magazine and a humor website, which at McSweeney's.net. It's very funny. Um, Dave Eggers is the founder. He wrote a few books. Um, the most famous one is called A Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius. And uh, yeah, I, I, so then I just sort of like worked my way up from intern to our customer service representative to uh, PR to then doing more like editorial and production management work. And then... How long, um, so how long we so it started with an intern which turned into another intern? Uh, no, no, then same one. Yeah, and then turned into a job. Yeah, it went from internship to full time job in the city of San Francisco. Yeah, in the right. Mission District of San Francisco. Yeah. Um, and I had another professor in college who his like parting words to me were, "You just need to to find a way to write about pop culture. Like you just need to do it." And I kind of like never really thought about it. And then that has ended up being my job. So yeah. I, I was really lucky to find a community in college with um, peers and professors who understood me right. and encouraged me to be myself and to find the path that was going to work for me. And I think I didn't, again, didn't realize at the time how meaningful their advice was, but it obviously had a huge impact as I am, as I am now doing what they told me to do. <laughs> so what, what had the greatest impact on teaching you how to write? <laughs> Probably my tenth grade English teacher, Miss Lou. Yeah, it's a high school English teacher. <laughs> yeah, she was she was really yes. great. She was rigorous and serious, um, and like really believed in putting as much thought into your work as you could. So she would. I remember reading um, A Tale of Two Cities in her class, and I I love Dickens, so I I think that's where I started to love Dickens. And we spent a lot of time dissecting the prose and all of his language, and then kind of taking the lessons from that dissection and putting it into our own work. And uh, yeah, I, she had a huge, huge impact. She also actually suggested Northwestern for me. So I think all of, all of my um, academic and professional choices have really been, been guided by teachers who have been, who, you know, who I've connected with and gave me their time so generously. Um, 
did you go to ESPN right after this internship? Is that around when you, so, how did, <laughs> and did you get hired at ESPN first or did you start working for Bill Simmons at Grantland right away? So when I was working at McSweeney's for Dave Eggers, Dave was recruited to work on Grantland, which was a sort of boutique within ESPN that my current boss, Bill, um, founded. And as a result, uh, and the reason that McSweeney's and Dave were involved was because Grantland had a print uh, journal that went along with it. It was kind of like a, a best of of Grantland. And we uh, we made books at McSweeney's. That was one, yeah. one of the things that we did. So when Dave was a consulting editor and I knew that there would be a, some kind of work that our company would be doing for Bill and his company, I asked to be on the project because I was a huge fan. Um, my current boss, Bill Simmons, uh, formerly known as, formerly and still known the as a sports, sports guy, guy um, was kind of like the original sports blogger. He Worked for ESPN, I think, starting in like 2004, maybe, uh, actually 2002, I think. Um, and he just sort of, uh, I think, invented sports blogging as we know it. Um, yeah. He would do a lot of humor and work in different references. He would do like running diaries of like watching the draft. And so it would be like minute to minute, like what he was thinking. And then he'd publish it a few hours later. Um and I was just a really big fan. When I would come home from school and, and be looking at my message boards about TV, I also would check on, on ESPN.com and right. see what if Bill had written and whatnot. So I was a really big fan. And so I asked to be on that project that was a collaboration between my then company and my future company. Right. And I also didn't like San Francisco after three years. I was just like, I'm, I'm done here. I need to move. Right. So I kind of parlayed the connection I had from the McSweeney's work into working directly for Grantland. And so as a result, they then hired me directly. So, I, kind of, so I backdoored my way in. Right. So what, what did, what, what part of what you were, of your abilities you were working at, did Bill really go, this is, I need this. I just sort of, I, I was like desperate to work there. I was like, I love Bill and I hate San Francisco. So I, I I'm just, I'm desperate and I want to, I want to move. So I just kind of was like, what do you guys need done? This new, Cause Grantland was brand new. I think when I started working with them directly, it was like right. two months old. And I was right. like, what do you need? And they needed someone to tweet out stories. They needed someone to, they just like needed more bodies in the office to create like an office culture. Yeah. And I was like, well, I'm alive. I'm here. Did you feel like you knew how to do what they were asking you to do? Absolutely you're not. Like, I don't know anything and I'm just going to. Absolutely not. I just sort That's of. That's awesome. I was just like, I, I'll figure it out. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know how to make books. We started making the Grantland Quarterly, but right. I learned how to use Adobe InDesign. Um, when I had been in college, I had a part-time job at a publishing company where I entered edits that um, before the books went to the printer, basically. And I used some Adobe products then, and so I, some software. So I had like a base, a little bit of a familiarity, but very little. Yeah. Um, so I like just, but I just learned, I think I like looked on YouTube, like how to use Photoshop, how to use InDesign. Um, YouTube has amazing tutorial videos on basically every topic under the sun. And I, I learned how to make books and then I was able to, and then from that, I just sort of was like, well, I guess I'll, I'll figure it out as I go along. And that's kind of, that's how I got to Grantland. And that was in the summer of 2011. Uh, and I think, you know, I don't know if, I mean, you called it a boutique website. Yeah. I mean, for, for real sports junkies, it was Nirvana. I Thanks. Mean, it was like a, amazing high level reporting, long form interviews, long form essays. Um, it was everything that you wanted as a real sports junkie as I am. Um, and I think you guys should be credited for how awesome. Thanks. Yeah. That was. It was a real passion project. Everyone who worked for it moved to LA for the job. So when we started working at Grantland, which we covered sports and pop culture and, um, and tried to be funny and also had reporting and whatnot, everyone moved to LA for the job. So it felt like a cause. It felt like yeah, yeah. we had moved for like a purpose, essentially. Um, I, I'm gonna, we're going to go to the ringer. Okay. Um, and I, there was, there was a, a lot of great stuff written about Juliet and the closing of the, which yesterday was the day ESPN shut off Grantland yeah. University. Did you know that? I did. Yeah. Every, um, every year we, uh, we, we know that. Right. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot written on that. I don't want to talk about, I'm not going to talk about that, but what I do want to talk about is, uh, what Bill said when, um, when the transition happened on the day that you guys, um, all jumped ship mm -hmm. and he said, and it's a great quote. Uh, we're keeping the band together, and we couldn't be, ba be happier about it. Simmons says, I've been working with Chris and Juliet since 2011, and Sean and Mallory short after. It's been a fantastic to watch them blossom into leaders and creative forces. 
I would never have wanted to do this company without them, which I thought was what an amazing, awesome statement to hear from your boss. Um, it's an incredible inner circle and the biggest reason why we're going to keep growing and thriving. That's awesome. So tell me, talk to me about um, the culture sure. of your company, of The <clears throat> Ringer, and, um, and, and what it's like. Sure. So The Ringer is a sports and pop culture media company. I think that's kind of the evolution from Grantland. We publish probably like 15 articles per day across uh, those topics, and, and also national affairs. Um, and occasionally politics uh, and tech. And then we also publish about, uh, we have about 30 active podcasts, which are basically um, like radio on demand. And so it's like you, most of our, our shows are anywhere from 40 minutes to an hour. And there, we, so we do like the Ringer NBA show, which is every, every day of the week or four, days, four or five days of the work week, we have a different um, podcast up in the morning which is two or three people talking about the nba from the night before if you're an nba fan this is i mean it's a must watch it's so good thanks it's yeah so good so we we do the ringer kind of like our, our biggest podcast that we have are the ringer nba show the ringer nfl show the watchable grab a podcast really quick just it, as we really sure talk more about pods yeah sure it's so it's basically like uh radio on demand where we the way that we approach it is experts talking about things they love um, and it's usually like a deep analytical conversation about whether it's I, I happen to cover The Bachelor. So if it's about The Bachelor or, uh, or basketball or movies or um, we do a lot of TV as well. So it's basically, if, you know, instead of getting into your car and turning on NPR or uh, Kiss, you just put on a podcast instead. Which I do every day. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So, so we do, yeah. So we do our, our website, then we do our podcast, and then we also do video uh, each day. We have a couple of like recurring shows on YouTube, but we most of our video output is either um, around like an event, like the tip off of the NBA season, or it's a lot of um, kind of complimentary content to our podcasts because there's just so much podcast content, and I would say podcasts are probably the least uh, searchable digital content. Like it's hard to find something that's been said on a podcast. You can't really Google it yet. I think that will probably change eventually. But right now, since it's not really Googleable, except to like find the show itself, it's hard to tell people like, this is the conversation we're having. This is what we care about right now. Like we really care about why the Nets have started 0 and 4. And it's hard, it's hard to message that without yeah. creating content around the podcast. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we spend a lot of time on that. Um, how big is your, and talk a little bit about the structure of The Ringer. Sure. Because I don't, even I, I, I can't really figure out the structure of a media company. I know Bill's the, yeah. the, the in charge, but what, talk about the structure of a media company and then um, how big is, how many employees work yeah. at The Ringer. And then, um, it's a like a 20 part question. And then, um, and then kind of dive into your actual job. Yeah, as sure. the director of production. Sure. So we are about 80 people. Um, 80? Yeah, 80. Wow. And yeah, over the last four years. Um, did you, what did you start with? Five. <laughs> uh, so we went from five to 80 in about four years. Wow. And we have basically four departments. So we have the website, which is called editorial. We have podcasts. We have video. We have social. Editorial is the biggest department because it has editors, writers, um, fact checkers, which is how I started working in media, and copy editors who uh, work with the fact checkers to make sure that everything is correct, the grammar is correct, um, and they handle a lot of like the actual posting of an article on, on the internet. So that's actually the part of the company that I started out. I started out as the managing editor there, and I started out sort of running the operations and day-to-day -day functioning of the website, but I actually work on that the least now. Right. I oversee the other three parts, the social, social team, podcast team, and video teams. And those, um, those are run like a a hybrid of sort of the way that TV runs and the way that like a website runs. We kind of meld those two things together. Yeah. And so we have about, I think we have like 40 people, about half the company works on the, on the website and the other half is then distributed across. Can you give me a profile of somebody on the social team and what their skill sets are sure. and like yeah. what their passions are and who, who is that person that is yeah. like their job is the social team. So we have, our social team is I think seven people. Um, and it's basically people who, love sports and pop culture as well and like really respond to the things that are that we make on the content side and then their skills tend to be um first of all everyone has to be like a pretty strong writer because you have to like write yeah. write tweets so foundationally company wide yeah 
strong writing yes. is really important. Yeah, and under and, and and strong writing means understanding like a, a tone and nuance and ways to creatively and smartly um, present like what are we doing? Because at, at all times, every person in the company we're we're still so young and new like needs to be thinking about how are we telling our audience and our fans like what we're up to today and tomorrow and, and the day after that. And the social team is on the front lines of that, and it's such a huge huge part of what we're doing right now. So they, you know, have to be strong writers to craft tweets and to write our news, our email newsletter and all that. But a lot of them are just like incredible Swiss Army knives. They also know how to use the Adobe suite where they can There's make... There's a lot of those around here in small places. Yeah. You wear a lot of different apps. Yeah. And honestly, it's, it's an incredible opportunity to be able to do multiple things at a small place or a big place really... I think is is really um, a gift because you get to hone so many different skills and you get to understand how a process, like a professional process, works from top to bottom. So, for example, back to our social team, they um, they will be like clued into like what's coming up on the website, and then they will have like a plan for here's how we're going to share like these articles. But then yeah. they also will be like, huh, this was a really interesting part of this story. How do I take a quote from that and turn it into a video that can be shared on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, which is where, where we are primarily. I mean, right. we got to get on TikTok, obviously, right. but uh, <laughs> we don't excel at dancing videos yet. So that'll, that'll come later. <laughs> um, but so, you know, I think the the folks who work on the social and audio right. and video sides, they, they, they like really, uh, they use Pro Tools and the the Adobe Suite Premiere and Audition primarily for, is that, for a lot. And you're of, saying that's industry standard, like that's yes. really. I think I think if you work um, in digital media on the like audio and video side, the Adobe Suite is is pretty standard. Uh, right. Premiere and Audition are kind of the foundation of it. Photoshop, I, I think there's like so many YouTube tutorials about how to use Photoshop because there's like a million ways to accomplish the same task within yeah, that yeah. program. But um, and that's true for a lot of Adobe stuff, but you can like hack it in a lot of ways, I think. Right. So there's a lot of self-taught Adobe users. And, you know, it, it's amazing. I think the access that people have now to publishing video is right. just like nothing I could have ever imagined. And ever. I think the people who've created all these platforms are true geniuses. To, yeah. to, to rethink the way that people communicate is just insane. So You guys spend a lot of time, because I hear it on the podcast, I hear it on Bill's. Bill spends a lot of time contemplating Current media, comparing it to former media, and trying to predict where media is going. Well, we, I mean, you know, we and, want you know, to stay current. Right. I mean, but he, it seems like you guys, I know you want to stay current, but it's, it seems like you guys are always just a step ahead. We try. He repeatedly has been a step ahead. <laughs> he has been. He, is that part of the culture? Yeah, definitely. I think, I think ultimately what guides us, and this kind of gets back to your question, is we want to be servicing ideas in the best way possible. So... Um, if someone has a story idea, like they want to write about, uh, I, I don't know, just, a, I guess an example is like what, like they want to write about like what's next in the Marvel cinematic universe. Like when, yeah. now that like, it's kind of, you know, they fa- the phase right. one has ended. Tristan could tell you right already. Like, <laughs> he could write it for you. <laughs> do you, do you want to tell, do you want to dig into that in a video explainer? Like yeah, where, yeah. where one person does a voiceover and we have an animated video presenting like here are the next five major storylines and five major characters that matter. Right. Or, um, do you want to do that in a video or is that better served by two really uh, well-informed people on staff having a conversation on a podcast that then is available for people to listen to? Or is that better as a written piece? So those are the things that we think about all the time. And also we're thinking about what are the ways that we could be um, servicing ideas that we're and not that right now. is that people driven, how that comes out? Like mm-hmm. if someone's saying, hey, I got this cool idea and this is how I want to present it. Yeah. And so tell me, talk to me a little bit about the creative side of like sure. how you guys are, are generating um, your ideas for um, putting out your content. Yeah. And we're kind of getting into, you know, the uh, Juliet media <laughs> personality. Sure, part yeah. Of your job here soon. So uh, I'll speak to both my own pod- podcast and some other ones. But okay. so, for example, one show that we're currently working on. It's called Ringer Dish. And I have on Wednesdays, if you subscribe to Ringer Dish on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts, um, or wherever you will be getting them in the future, uh, on Wednesdays, me and one of my coworkers, we do a show about celebrity culture. And we tend to talk a lot about um, the royal family and uh, celebrity memoirs. I have and- my own royal family <laughs> consultant on <laughs> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> good to know. I'm glad to. I'm glad to know that now. Uh, 
So we do a show on Wednesdays, and then on Fridays, another group of our colleagues do another show that is more, it's like, just like a slightly different set of celebrities they care about. Um, like I would say like their patron saint is like Harry Styles, essentially, uh, where our where our hours is probably like Prince Harry. So we're still trying to figure out how to fill out the show even further. So that's like Wednesdays and Fridays right now. And we're, yeah. and we're trying to figure out programming for it and like what are some cool ideas. So I asked someone on staff to send me some pitches. I just like, yeah. what are some things that you're into right now? And like, how can we turn that into some podcast ideas? And she had a lot of great ideas. One was about um, like a, an in-depth ranking of every Christmas movie on Netflix. Um, and an- another... My wife would watch every single one of them. Uh, well, there's more coming very soon. So um, another was like she, you know, she's a, a young woman who's probably like 25 and she's just watching Seinfeld for the first time. And I think a lot of people are having the experience of watching Friends for the first time. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. sort of like, how do we, how do we have, uh, how do we turn that into a podcast? And so she had a lot of awesome ideas, like many more than I, what I just listed. And I was thinking, as I was thinking them through, I, I was thinking, you know, the yes for pod, no for this pod. But then I looped in some other of my colleagues, like the, the person who oversees all of our editorial pop culture coverage. And I was like, hey, Andrew, like, here are some of these ideas I got. I think two or three of these would be better as written pieces. Like, yeah. why don't you touch base with the woman who pitched them? So basically, you know, we have a pretty like collaborative and open uh, dialogue going all the time about like, here's what this person on our staff wants to do yeah. here. Like, how do we do it? And then I will say the person, who, uh, this woman, Jordan, who I asked for her pitches, um, her primary job is not even uh, like creating content. Like she's a fact checker. So uh, it was, pre- it's but pretty that's cool. So awesome. Yeah. And so that's what, you know, part of our culture is we really want people to have opportunities in, in many ways. And so it's not just about um, the one thing that you've been hired for and, right. and whatnot, right. but also it's like, this is, this is how you join our com- the company and then where, how do you grow within it? Something that we really care about. That's awesome. Um, I want to talk about reality TV. Sure. Yes, I'd love to. It is an enigma, (laughs) and and I've never really fully understood it, and yet it's a train wreck that I cannot turn away from. And um, what what do you love about reality TV, and is it is it real? (laughs) I mean, I know it's such. It seems like such an outdated question, but I really, from someone who is. You know, it gets it, oftentimes it feels like to me that it's, uh, um, you know, like my generation when we were watching professional wrestling. Sure. And we would argue back and forth like, no, it's real. Hulk Hogan really did do that. And then it would be like, no, it's not. So I often use camp as an example for this. I think when you're in production <laughs> on a reality TV show, when you are, you know, you, most reality shows, they are filmed over like a course of anywhere from eight to 14 weeks essentially. And then, and then that's it. And you just move on or hopefully you should. Many people do not. And they try to get into another reality show. Um, I think when you're in that bubble, when you're intensely in it, it feels real. So I covered the bachelor. I have, I've been doing a bachelor podcast for seven years. How did that happen? Just by happenstance or you love it? (laughs) Um, I've always liked reality TV. I think it's kind of part of my, um, what you kindly called liking to have information, I call gossiping. It's part, it's part, <laughs> part of my interest in gossip, I think, is liking reality TV because um, it's great fodder for gossip about people you don't know and will never have to face. Um, Has that ever happened? Uh, well, I've interviewed a lot of Bachelor people. Have who you had to face them? Yeah. So I ha- and there because you have to have you, like you literally your job is to have opinions. Yes, and I'm not always very nice, but I try not to be like needlessly mean um, and say things I actually believe, so that when I do meet these people. You can back it up. Uh, yeah. I'd be like, well, I said this and here's why. I, I, last year I interviewed someone who came in second on The Bachelorette and I never thought he should be The Bachelor, but he really wanted to be The Bachelor. He, yeah. he didn't get it. And we talked about why I didn't think he should be The Bachelor. And he was like, okay, I understand. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't, say it's, I wouldn't say it's real in that it's like these people who allegedly fall in love like, yeah. and go on to have these relationships. But I do think that when you're in the moment and you're, you, know, you don't get to have a cell phone and you don't get to, you don't get to do anything but read. You can't watch right. TV. You can't re- like look at the news. Nothing. Um, I think you believe it. So yeah. I think to that extent it's like quote unquote real. I think like the real housewives are less real because they, like, 
they create contrivances. Do you hear that, Kel? For it's not as real as we think it is. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that I think the feelings are real, if, yeah. if not the actual events. Um, but I got into that to answer your other question because at Grantland, when I first started there, I was extremely close with one of my coworkers, and we had like an open office, and he and I would just t- yell to each other across the office about reality <laughs> TV. And so Bill was like, why don't you guys turn this into a podcast? And so it started out as a reality show That's and awesome. he's still one of my best friends and we no longer work together. We're still very close. And when we stopped working together, I kind of refocused to just do The Bachelor um, yeah. or to have it had to be kind of the driving force, though I, I cover other shows too. Um, and yeah, it was just really born out of our conversation. We have we find that podcasts uh, with good chemistry between hosts, really, yeah. um, people really respond to that. It's I like do. it's kind of like being part of a friendship. I think a, lo- sure. a lot of podcasts are usually driven by two people who, on a regular basis, are talking to each other about their shared passions and enthusiasms. Yep. And so, as a listener, you get to follow along their friendship essentially as it as it kind of coalesces. I'm so excited to dive into Mallory and, and the Star Wars pod. Oh, cool! Did, yeah, she and Jason. In. Yeah, it's perfect time to take in the deep dive. So I cannot wait. Yeah, to, we have and a- they get along well. We have another show called Binge Mode, which um, is an incredibly rigorous and deep podcast about first it was Game of Thrones, then they did Harry Potter, and now they're doing Star Wars. Yeah. And um, it's really impressive. They are both incredibly smart and do so much work to make like the best they, podcast possible. It, it's, it's unbelievable, their, their wealth of knowledge. Um, I want to showcase two projects that sure. you have had a direct hand on. The first one, Rich, can you go to our first, um, or uh, Tristan, can you go to the first clip? Um, the 100 best TV episodes of the century. I so when I first read and saw and heard this, you can just leave it there, Trist, on that. Um, uh, how did you guys possibly uh, find a way to take all TV from this century and create 100 specific episodes? We have a we have a way of doing them. Um, we basically get our staff to submit. Is that triggering people that? If you hit yeah. no, if you hit no thanks, then it will just go to a, a yeah something oh, good. less bad. It's, you know, what, just scroll down to number fifty, because that's our next topic. Go ahead. <laughs> you can jump on the side if you go to six. Yeah. So I, I help. Uh, I work with a, two people who design and develop these, and then I'm sort of like the I, I manage it so that I, I like will give them notes, and then they'll implement them. I'll give them more notes, and then making websites is really hard. Really, really, really hard. Um, I think that's actually one of the beauties of social media is that it makes it possible for everyone to like create stuff without having to deal with how difficult it is to do this kind of thing. I honestly wouldn't recommend it. It's so stressful. The, this <laughs> is, but it's, it's so unbelievable. Thanks, right? I mean, yeah. You have, you have amazing, one, you guys are able to just get it on the list uh, in terms of 100. You've got video clips on the right. You guys have got uh, a really brilliantly written recaps and why they're important. Um, of each episode, and how long from start to finish did it take to produce this this piece? Seven months. Oh my gosh. In seven months. So it started oh with gosh. a lot of editorial meetings where people would, our whole staff would submit lists of I think they I think people so we we did episodes not shows so it had to be like the best episode of this show, um, and so our, we asked our staff for like top twenties and then a committee would sort of call that into a preliminary list and then we would fight about it. We fought a lot about the top ten. Um, number one, spoiler alert, is an episode of Lost. Um, <laughs> and uh, people have really turned on Lost since it ended. I don't know how many of you have watched it, but it's excellent through four seasons, four of six seasons, and then it takes a little bit of a turn. But I still really recommend it. Um, and so the editorial work took probably a lot, it took a lot of time. And then the actual like production of making the website was a more condensed, like um, probably like, two months and then the last like two weeks are extremely intense and it's a lot of testing and there's just so many elements that go into literally making a website from scratch it's really it's it's so tricky um and a lot of smart people have figured out ways to make it a lot easier with like blog platforms like medium and other ones like that uh but then to use their platform you have to like fit inside of their boxes and their rules and for something like this we wanted to have um something completely unique and original but just to express our point of view and just sort of doing this project is not only fun because we believe in the list, but it also yeah. is a way of kind of messaging to people like this is what the ringer cares about. And right. you can tell because the design is custom it's and amazing. because the writing is so it's insane fantastic. and impassioned. Yeah. Um, we really care about TV at the ringer. So, and I, I really care about uh, many Dawson's television Street. shows. Yeah. I love Dawson's Creek. How did you, how I'm, I was super frustrated. How did you lose 50? 
How did this episode? You clearly I, got I, outvoted in the room. Yes, I did. I also. Is, um, where did you want this to be? It I, wasn't I, fifty. I think this is about right. I, oh, I do. I not do. True. No, I, I think it's about right. I was <laughs> mad. I was mad that there wasn't. Uh, Grey's Anatomy wasn't higher. I think Grey's oh. Anatomy is is criminally underrated because yeah. for for many reasons. But I think uh, it's very hard to maintain a show over a long period of time. Yeah, and, and keep it fresh also, and interesting and, and incredibly relevant. difficult to have your characters develop in a realistic way. Yeah, and the doctors who start out on the show who are like now parents of like multiple kids, you, you see them go from being like twenty six year old residents to forty year old attending doctors who are actually like interesting. And also, it's a female driven show, and I don't think that female driven shows like that that are um, really like interested in what it's like to become a mother and a parent in the workplace like get a lot of credit so I was I was pissed I'm yeah, still yeah. pissed but I think it's actually important um, and that's one of the reasons I also really love this job is I think that sometimes like shows like Grey's Anatomy can be written off as like silly or something like that but first of all that is someone's life's work like that yeah. they're working on that show and I also do think it it uh, presents a type of diversity and a different view, like view, than a lot of quote unquote prestige television. So, I, I, I we try to represent that in this list that it's not just about like the shows that win all the awards, but other ones that are just like part of the fabric of people's lives. Yeah, I've literally got another hour worth of, <laughs> of conversation. I'm sorry, with you. I'm, I'm talking no, too it's long. Fine. No, it's fine, and I'm just I, I wish I had more more time, and I want to make sure that I leave time. Do you guys want time for questions? Okay, good. I thought so. I thought. <laughs> She's going to stay for lunch as well after. Yes. So, you know, we, we, you guys are going to have time to connect with her and, and touch with her. Um, I want to, uh, we're going to jump to the last link because I think it was, um, nope, not that one. We're skipping that one. Scroll up. Scroll, scroll down, I mean. Have you seen this? Yeah, yeah. I, when I, I, in, in my research, when I came across this, I was really like, I know her. I get to, I'm, so pr- I'm so proud of Thank her. Thank you. When I, when I read it, I wanna, I'm going to read what they wrote about you. Sure. And don't be embarrassed. Okay. Uh, Littman is an amalgam of athlete social lives expert. The Ringer edition and con- the Ringer editor, you were editor at the time, and contributor, pop cultural guru, podcaster, and media mogul extraordinaire. She hosts The Sources Say formerly of Grantland, where her unique love of Chandler Parsons, Parsons? Mm-hmm. Parsons and other athletes' lives off the court takes center stage. Lipman is also a podcast on Channel 33 about the Bachelor Food News and a hundred other things you didn't know. I love this line. You didn't know you cared about until you spent time listening to her, talking about them. She makes an instant connection with each guest and with you, her listener, like a friend you've always had. If, if you're a fan of Boogie or... Sauce, Casso, Castillo, yeah. Castillo. That was Nick um, Stauskas. <laughs> the Challenger or Claytheism, which I, I, we don't have time. I want to know what Claytheism is. Um, or fun or laughter. People are things you should spend more time with Littman. It, it's a really amazing, unbelievable Mount Rushmore list of people that you're included with there. And I was like, Thanks. I was really proud of you. Thank you. And, and, it, and it, the whole article is about women in sports and celebrating them in sports media. And my, I guess my final question for you is, is going to be, um, what is, um, what's it like being a woman in sports and a, you know, fairly male dominated? Sure. Um, it's heavier I, question. Yeah. I, I don't frequently think about it in those terms because and I, I didn't either until I read. This yeah. Thing. Just because I have been working with the same group for almost 10 years and I've always I've never felt like at a disadvantage I I don't think that's representative I think that's a credit to the people I've been working with um (laughs) so you know I definitely think there are certain biases you have to overcome and I think in a lot of uh sports fans will will be have like an unconscious bias against a a woman's opinion but I think you can easily win people over if you know a lot I, I think like having Doing research and having information and sort of um, being rigorous goes a really long way. So particularly in the way that we present our work, um, we really care about having like deep conversations and 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 not and not deep like as in like heavy, but as in like having all the facts and knowing as much as possible. And when you're able to go go long on something, I think you just prove your bona fides. So, yeah. My 
literally my favorite part of working, one of my favorite parts of working with teenagers has always been um, riding in a van and talking to mm. kids. It's the best time for me to connect. And, um, and you're on my Mount Rushmore <laughs> of teenagers that I've talked to over the years. I used and, to do something very annoying. Do you remember? What was it? We would be leaving camp and <laughs> before we would get in the van, I would go and use the one communal computer and I would look at the directions on MapQuest because I didn't, <laughs> I did, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't trust. <laughs> that I wouldn't get lost. <laughs> yeah. And so every single time I would, I would look up the directions. <laughs> That's right. And it was like really annoying. Oh, I totally forgot about that. I mean, I, I'm annoyed looking back on it. And I, I was the person who did How it. How many times I go, Julia, where am I going though? Yeah. And I, I, I just like, I always want to, I also just want to know. I was like, I want to know how we're going to get there and how we're going to get back. And like, what are the roads? And so I think I just always like to know stuff. And so that serves you well in podcasting. Can I tell you, it, 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 it fills my heart with joy that I still get to do that with you. I just have to put on a pod and I get to do that. Um, thank you so much. I thank know, you for having I me. It's been really fun. I know how you are. And I really, really can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming here. We're going to take a few questions. Yeah, absolutely. All right? Happy questions. To. Oh, see, listen, you're a rock star. This hands went up quick. I, I um, know your hand went up first. Okay. Uh, Go so, ahead. So, um, I want to talk about the NBA. And so I kind of have three questions. But the sure. The last one is the most important to me. Why does the media display images and videos of things like fights that, you know, really don't have a lot of meaning to the game itself? I'm talking about, like, Joel Embiid. Sure. Or Anthony Towns, you know. That was yesterday. Poking each other's eyes, you know. Mm-hmm. Ben Simmons putting these guys in a chokehold. Yes. Why don't they display that? And why does it seem so much more common to see fines, suspensions, and ejections from the NBA? And do you think the NBA has gotten softer since this? <laughs> um. Yes! This is why I love you guys. You're awesome. You're so smart. <laughs> I don't think it's gotten softer. I think the players' interests have changed. I think that there's a different way of being a professional athlete that didn't exist 30 years ago um, because there's just a way to have a a different kind of platform like you know you uh like if, if you went back and researched like the 19 like the pistons like the bad boy pistons essentially like you would know about them as a unit but you probably wouldn't know that much about like adrian dantley's life you know you wouldn't you would know that like they lost rick mahorn because of the expansion draft but you probably wouldn't know a lot about his personal life but like we know so much about towns and mb and simmons's personal lives so i think that that has made it seem like maybe they're quote unquote off, but it's just that we actually know more about them. Similarly, I think we see more of the fights because there's just more media. There's just like a constant churn of like what's happening in the NBA right now and, and people care. And I think that in the sort of um, entertainment eyes version of the NBA, people like care about fights the way that you care about us like a celebrity getting into a car accident. Um, like, I think it's like similar to how TMZ probably like grotesquely covered Kevin Hart getting into a car accident is just, and which luckily he's fine. He's going to be fine. Um, and similarly, like luckily Towns and Embiid and Simmons are all, uh, you know, they're not like physically harmed. It's like not a good influence, but I think people just care about it as entertainment. as like an ongoing reality show more than just a sport with like ath- athletic excellence. And so it, it lends itself to a more dramatized and, um, I guess, like, kind of, like, less pure view of the game. Do you think that Twitter, um, something like Twitter has <laughs> changed the game um, because, like, it changes the images of the players and biases that the game, so it makes, like, the referee see this person in certain ways of bad boys? Um, I don't think it's changed. Well, it shouldn't change it for them. I mean, that would be a big problem. But I do think it's changed it for fans. And so I think it changes the way that, NBA players think of themselves off court. I think the way that the game has changed itself with like towards, you know, um, positionless basketball and three point sh- and the three point shot, it's kind of a separate evolution, but it is related to probably the types of basketball players that are playing. Like you don't have to be six, eight or taller to be a basketball player anymore. Tristan. So when, like for your bench box podcast, mm-hmm. how many times do the hosts of the show like, watch the episode or watch the movie like what would they how many times would you say? so for binge mode Mallory and Jason are extremely exhaustive and they watch it like several times um <laughs> for my own personal bachelor podcast I watch each episode probably two times um and like try to take notes though I usually uh 
like the, set, the first time around I won't take notes and the second time I do. So it really depends on the host style. I would say we have a lot of people who like to study. So they'll watch something like at least two times before getting into it. Um, but it, it's really like depends on your preference and we let the hosts really kind of determine that for themselves based on like what works best. Um, Mal and Jason, also one of the things that's great about Binge Mode and Harry Potter is there's the source text, of course. And so they also like read the books like at least three times each book, both Harry Potter and uh, Song of Ice and Fire. Here. Henry, sorry. I was up to three following a fire. See that? I'm assuming you know what Nate Silver's 538. Mm-hmm. So how does 538, um, specifically related to sports, differ from like the ringer? Sure. So I think the kind of the foundation of their coverage is always the data. Um, and we're probably more storyline driven and that's not just to say like fights, but also, um, trends and how the games are being played. And, you know, like I think we'll probably like, I, you know, we last year had a, a really deep story on the nuggets, um, focused around Jokic and that turned out to be like a major storyline for the rest of the season. So we're, we're pretty interested in how the game is being played, um, before the season started, Bill on his podcast talked about how the Warriors probably wouldn't make the playoffs, and he really had quite low expectations for them, lower than most people, which, of course, now I think Sorry, will, will come true, especially with Curry being hurt. Um, and so uh, we're, we're a lot more where I think they use their data to make predictions and then spin out from there. We start a lot more with kind of like what are some of the narratives that we care about right now. So it's just actually, it's honestly just a different way of like looking at narrative. For them, data is the story. And for us, people tend to drive it a little bit more. But actually, when I worked at Grantland, our kind of like our sister website was 538, and, and we, um, it was kind of like a, a little group within ESPN. Also, um, I was looking at the Ringer's website earlier today, and I noticed under sports, you, it, I only saw uh, articles for like the NBA or NFL. Mm-hmm. And, much nothing about Major League Baseball or the NHL. Why is that? Uh, on baseball, I think that might be a, a architectural problem because it's like struck like we didn't like tag stories properly because we covered we covered baseball quite a bit. Um, we don't have a staff writer devoted to hockey. We just have found that the audience is just um, smaller, and so we kind of we swoop in for the big moments, but we have less day to day coverage. Steve. So I know like ESPN and stuff, they're kind of paying NBA a lot to get the rights to, you know, put on shows and make a deal. And so for when you just started the thing, the mm-hmm. so how do you get copyrights on pictures and et cetera? So we pay Getty. We have like a license to use Getty images for photos. Um, and for video, we use fair use. Um, you know, we work with a lawyer to talk about like what is that permissible and how can you use. And there's, and basically the, it's, it's not like hard and fast rules, but basically when we're making a podcast or a video that needs to have either our, like sound from a game or video from a game, if it's demonstrating a point, then it falls under fair use laws, and so you're able to use them. But we couldn't like broadcast a full game, essentially. So you're not able to have a full game? No, we're not. So we're not. So that's a different kind of business model, essentially, where a lot of sports media is more invested in showing games. For us, it's more about covering them and being like complimentary. And I think another reason why why um, the website and the podcast network work together the way they do is because they go with the thing. They are not the thing, if that makes sense. Jack, yeah. what would you say the biggest your biggest competitor your biggest like competitor is when it comes to like another website? You know, Good how, question. Like, the Some of this. Sure. Like, Butting heads because they're do they sort of like report on some more things. What would you say, like the biggest competitor is that you always want to be like? Tough, tough to sure, I kind of think of it of like who am I jealous of? Like what stories am I jealous of? Do I, I wish we had? I wish we thought of that. Yeah, or said that or wrote that. I think on the culture side, um, I'm routinely jealous of New York Magazine. They and um, the Cut was part of like also their culture coverage. I think they do awesome work um, and really cool stories, and they often are very funny. Um, the sports side is, I think by it kind of, it's more like topic by topic. I mean, ESPN just has so many basketball writers that are great. I love that. I love Zach Lowe. I used to work with him. He's yeah. a, he's a great guy. Um, and yeah, I would say I'm like r- routinely jealous of, of Zach and, and the, the athletic has also some really awesome reporters that I think do some really great work. Um, it's, it's hard to get 
athletes to trust you. So when, when there are really good stories, also like Mina Kimes is someone who I think does awesome work for ESPN. Um, and when you are able to kind of cultivate that relationship to turn it into telling a really great story, like she recently did, uh, um, a, Hop- a Hopkins story from the Texans and that was really good. And yeah, I think like, so it's a lot of, a lot of writers and across the board, New York magazine. Ben. Uh, I was just curious in a world of kind of shortening attention spans. Great question. Uh, how do you this fight is, for this is clicks it. and how do you fight for maintaining somebody actually reading a more? Dude. So, my we, boy. <laughs> proud of you. Good question. Um, so we've actually found that our really exhaustive work across the pl- all platforms does better than fast stuff. I mean, if, if we're like doing like a really fast, like Steph Curry broke his hand, let's write about it for the next 30 minutes, then Google will help you get people because it'll like end up in news when you Google Steph Curry. Um, but if we're not doing something like that's super immediate, something like binge mode or the way that we, we did a lot of Game of Thrones coverage, like a lot. Uh, but being like completely comprehensive and, and having training your readers and listeners to know that you are like their one stop shop for all things NBA or all things Game of Thrones or all three, all things Oscars or whatever the topic is helps people come back and stay because they know that like you'll be giving them everything they need. And so that you, it's almost like you kind of make it so that they don't even need to go anywhere else. So you become like a destination for them. And just a quick follow-up. Sure. Do you think that will continue to work with our generation, generation Z? Because You'll have to tell me, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> bit more sporadic. sporadic. Look at whatever the first thing that comes up is. Sure. I definitely think that, <coughs> from my perspective and many of my colleagues, we are very uh, in awe of, of people who find success on TikTok. I think that... Um, Everything with Old Country Road has just been absolutely mind blowing, and but at the same time, at the heart of that phenomenon is an incredibly charismatic and talented performer who's like probably one of a kind. Like I think like he's like on the level, same level as um, like Drake in terms of like just being someone that you want to watch and having like a catchy song and everything. So I think there's a little bit of trying to understand how to how to reach an audience by going to where they are, and that's something that that to your point we've really learned is that outside of like long articles and long podcasts, going to the place where people who have the same interests are is important. So like people who care about the NBA draft, like how do we tap into where they are instead of trying to like draw them somewhere else? So it's kind of depends, it's a little, it's a little topic by topic, but it's definitely something that we think about a lot. And I think with particularly digital video is hard to predict because it, it's so much dependent on platform and whatnot. Keone? I'm like, do you guys ever have, like, feelings? I mean, I'm going to ask, like, what's your opinion of this NFL drama? Like, we have Sam Darnold and this whole ghost thing, and then we have, like, Antonio Brown being cut, and then we have, like, the Dolphins. Their entire website's filled with feelings, yeah. And then we have the yep. 49ers absolutely demolishing the NFC. Yeah. I mean, like, what's your, like, do you guys ever, like, make, like, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, you know, I think the Antonio Brown stuff was very complicated and, and super. we used, you know, we really encouraged our writers to work closely with our editors to express an opinion and also to back it up and explain why they felt that way. So we encourage people to have strong opinions and that produces amazing work. I think the next step after realizing how you feel about something is working with your team, whether that's a producer or an editor or whomever, to express it in a way that is um, concrete and lot and like sort of follows like a train of thought essentially. Because I, I, I do think in sports there's you know and I think um, similarly with the Astros uh, that was oh a com- that was also just really complicated and Super. it's difficult. It's you know I think I think one th- like it's okay to acknowledge that this is like a generally generationally great baseball team that is also very complex on a emotional and moral uh, level. And yeah. so those are the kinds of conversations we actually want to have and we want to have feelings about. It's just the challenge and the work is figuring out the best way to express that. Kathy? Okay, so I may be showing my age here, but this is a passion for you, but it's also a job and a career. So how do you all get paid and what is the funding? Uh, it, like how again, does this I'm all so, yeah. happen? Um, yeah, we're, uh, we're an advertising-driven business. Uh, if you look at our podcast, there 
most of the logos have a brand on them where it says like I, my bachelor podcast was uh, presented by Cape line, which is a beverage company, um, state farm. We would do a lot of work with state farm. Um, so we work with advertisers. Tristan. Uh, do you guys get like, I know some like media outlets get like exclusive, like previews to things. Do you guys ever try to reach out, uh, you know, like for example, getting an early subscription to Disney Plus to check it out, see what the platform. Yes. Uh, I wish there were Mandalorian screeners. There are not. But uh, we have like Apple Plus screeners and I get a Bachelor screener each week. Um, it kind of depends on the individual host and what, and what their experience is like. I think those kinds of things tend to come along the longer you work in the industry. So it used to be very, it's actually extremely difficult to get a screener for The Bachelor. Um, but I have been covering it for so long with such intense enthusiasm that I, I wiggled my way into it. Um, but yeah, and one of the benefits of covering pop culture and being based in LA is that you can go to a lot of movie screenings. I, I personally don't because it's not my beat, but my colleagues who cover movies, they are, go to screenings all the time and I'm jealous that they've already seen Little Women, which I'm eagerly anticipating. So, uh, yeah, we do that kind of stuff all the time. We're, we're up against it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have one question. Just what, what, uh, in your Rolodex of stuff you've been watching and consuming, uh, what do we have to see? What is on? What is on your docket? What are you watching that you're like? The world needs to see this. What's your recommendation? Um, oof, I watched a lot of TV over the summer. Um, I just watched Looking for Alaska on Hulu, which I really so, loved. All oh, right, I'm glad you said that. Did you? I haven't seen it yet. Can't wait to see it. It's based on a John Green novel, also about his experience in, at a uh, boarding school in Alabama when he was growing up. I just watched that and I loved it. Um, what else do I really love? I watch so much TV that sometimes I like forget about it. Um, <laughs> I, oh God, I'm just trying to think. Um, I'm sorry, this is what really was letting you down. Um, no, you're not letting me down. I just saw I night. saw Parasite, which okay. which behind my favorite movie of the year, nice. which is a Korean film. Um, it's excellent. <laughs> it's just absolutely excellent. It's a thriller. It takes a crazy turn in the middle. Uh, it was really good though, and. Um, what else did I really like recently? I, I'm really anticipating Little Women. I can't wait. Cool. Well, you can tell us more. Like Juliet, thank you so much. Yeah. Of course.